it's an amazing story. It's very serendipitous how you came up with the idea of the HIV virus to potentially cure cancer. Talk, talk about where it started, where the idea came from. Um, so Cameron, this is a field called synthetic biology, um, where most medicine has tried to restore and fix problems and not really do, um, you know, make things better than nature could do. So we have evolutionary biology, which is how we got here. But I learned from athletics and so on that, you know, steroids and drugs could make your muscles better than nature made them. And now in medicine, we're trying to do the same thing, which is, in this case, make the immune system more potent. So we've known for a long time that the immune system responds to cancer, but it usually loses the immune system and cancer wins. So now we have approaches to make the immune system better than it was born. And in my case, it turned out to be I was forced into the field of HIV research. Um, I was going to Stanford in 1971, and I got drafted into the Navy because of the Vietnam War. And in the Navy and in the military, you're not allowed to do cancer research, but you are allowed to do infectious disease research. So that's what I had to do until I got out of the Navy. So you were a cancer specialist who was yeah. sort of forced into infectious disease. Yeah, I was world. trained medically to, as a physician in cancer, but then I had to do 10 years, and I was glad I did it now because I had my feet in two fields. So this cross-cutting thing, I learned how to engineer HIV, and then when I got out of the Navy, I then started to do what I always had trained to do, was, was work on leukemia. And so we, you know, Emily was the first child to ever be treated with an HIV engineered T cell. And, and our patient that we're going to have come up here was the second man ever to be treated. We, we first had to start treating uh, adults before we could treat kids. So we have a lot more experience in the adults now. So when you first thought this could potentially work, was there kind of an aha moment that got you to a place where, where you said, okay, we should try this, this is... I mean, we um, made incremental, you know, I've worked on this for about 25 years. We first had to learn how to grow T cells. So in the film, it's not clear, but the cells were out of Emily's body for 10 days, and that's during a time when they're reprogrammed to become leukemia-specific, we say serial killer cells, where in the movie it showed each T cell could kill a thousand tumor cells. Um, so that became the idea is to make the first self-replicating drug. So we give cells to the patient once and they last the rest of their life is the idea, which we know from vaccines that can happen. If you have a good immunization as a child, you're protected the rest of your life. And so we had a number of advances over the years to, to solve the different problems and, and growing the T cells and engineering them. And then, um, you know, we started our trial with trepidation because it was the first time people had ever, in cancer patients, had ever had an HIV engineered cell. And the first three patients had striking results, but they had what we call in oncology and in medicine, they had what's called on-target toxicity. So they had, Emma had fevers of 106 degrees for a week. And that was what medical oncologists call, is called shake and bake. But it was not due to infection, it was due, she had pounds and pounds of tumor, and the patient you're gonna meet next had five pounds of tumor that went away over a period of about a week. And that's a violent reaction that the immune system does to get rid of this, the tumors. And so we saw that in our first patients, and we didn't know what it was until um, the results came back and we couldn't find leukemia anymore. And so then we figured it was good. And now, <laughs> when we treat patients, they all start really having celebrations when they get a 103 degree fever or more. It's an amazing thing. So on target toxicity is okay. The problem with previous oncology and cancer therapies is the, target, the toxicity is generally what's called off-target. So people get nausea, vomiting, the hair falls out, and the things you've seen with chemotherapy, that's not doing nothing to help get rid of your tumor. That's side effects. So now the, the new thing in oncology and so on that will cure cancer will be on-target effects with precision therapies, and we have now the science to, to do that. So we're at a tipping point now where we're gonna see a major change in the way uh, cancer is treated. So talk about the success rate. We're gonna meet Doug in a minute, who is yeah. who's a great success story. Um, but you, you started with adults before you could try this with children, as you said, but how, how overall successful has it been with adults and children? Yeah, so we, we've learned a lot. I mean, our first, you know, we treated three patients in six weeks and all three had really striking results. So, um, you know, very advanced chemotherapy refractory leukemia. and then. 
um, we ran out of the virus to engineer the cells, and um, so we didn't know then if we just got lucky. I mean, the literature is filled with reports where the first patient treated does well on some new experimental therapy, and then it can never be replicated. So now we know um, that it can be. We've treated about 50 patients, um, and, the, and the 20 children, the response rate, like Emily's, is over 80% now in, in people who have really a death sentence because they can't, there is no therapy standard. So. We, we now know it wasn't a fluke. And then the other thing we know is that the patients haven't relapsed. So we treated 30 patients like the patient you'll see, Doug Olson, the adults with chronic leukemia, and no one's relapsed. So, so that's the power of the immune system is it can be both have a, a, the killing effect on the tumor and then it can have what's called immunosurveillance, but basically cells, these car cells hang around in the patient and now are on surveillance for either recurrent tumor or a uh, new tumor that might arise. So you're talking about a cure. This isn't a treatment. Um, so, you know, that's, I stuttered when that, you know, that, that film, by the way, I want to give a shout out, shout out to Ross Kaufman. He, he was the, the uh, producer of that film. He did Born in the Brothels. Uh, so he came and made that three minute documentary. Um, and I couldn't even say the word cure because in cancer that we never have done that. We've had therapies that try to um, control the disease or put you in remission. But it's, you know, so now I think with the targeted therapies and the understanding, the, the goal in cancer will be curing it. And, uh, you know, it's early on, we have 50 patients. We can't find a single leukemia cell in Emily or in, in Dr. Olson, who you're gonna meet next. And, but whether they're cured, you know, is gonna take a lot longer um, observation. So where, where are you in the process? So, you know, you've had extraordinary success, but to the average person out there who reads about your success, this is not available to them. No, and that, that I, you know, that keeps me awake every night. I have had thousands and thousands of emails from people who want to be treated, and we treated 51 patients at the University of Pennsylvania, and it is not available anywhere else. And, um, so we're in an issue where we have a, a limiting resource. Uh, so for instance, like organ transplantation and, and how do you allocate those? So we're dealing with that, but fortunately, you know, we're in an area where there's a value of death. There has been no pharmaceutical uh, investment in this kind of area. It's all been done in the academic uh, arena uh, because there's very, people tried these things before and they didn't work. They're very disappointing uh, results. So, what, when we published our first three cases back in 2011 then, um, we had a lot of people knocking on our doors, and I'm pleased now to say that Novartis, just a year ago, you know, invested in this, and they've made a large plant, and it's now become an engineering problem. Um, what we do now is it's a boutique way to grow the patient cells, and it takes PhDs to do that. And, um, uh, so highly, and there are not enough PhDs to train, you know, to treat, you know, common cancers. Fortunately, you know, leukemia in children is an orphan disease, and, and the process we have right now can be made available to everyone by Novartis just by training enough technologists. But to do a common cancer like breast cancer or lung cancer, it needs to be automated, and that means robots. So what the pharmaceutical industry can do is now make. Car, these are called CAR T cells, chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And, but the analogy now really is to Detroit. I mean, the initial uh, assembly lines for automobiles were all done by hand, and they went along and um, would put cars together. The, the kind of CAR T cells that we have now need to be done by robots, and, and now robots assemble 80% of the car in Detroit. And, and so there's just been no investment to date in in this kind of technology, you know, for cell-based therapies. I think as the pharmaceutical industry, you know, does this, it's now an engineering problem, not a scientific problem anymore, but engineering. And now that that investment will be made, we'll be able to extend this kind of approach to diseases like uh, HIV and AIDS and be able to control those diseases with engineered cells rather than having to take drugs every day. And we'll be eventually able to treat autoimmune diseases that you know, where the immune system needs to be shut down rather than turned on, like we do for cancer. So I think, you know, there'll be a new industry to, uh, to do this. So the next steps, FDA approval, and is there a timeline? You know, what is, give people some sense of what it might be like. Yeah, well, so it's, you know, the usual timeline was, is, is embarrassing, but um, 
from when you first treat a patient, you know, the beginning trial, it's called a phase one trial, that average time is 12 years to when it gets commercially approved. Wow. And, you know, we, and it costs about $600 million per drug. That's what we face these days, and it's very inefficient. Um, um, and here we have this so-called valley of death where we did a lot of, everything was done in the academic sphere, but there was no investment in having the commercial launch, you know, making the industrial plants, the industrial scale. It was all in our little boutique place at the university. So now there's this catch-up time that the uh, industry is doing, but they actually think because the results are so striking that it can be, you know, commercialized on the results from small numbers of patients on trials, and that maybe in three or four years this will be, you know, available worldwide. So let, a, let me bring up Doug Olson. Doug, come on up and join us. Um, Doug is a survivor. Yeah. So um, he is one of your success stories. Yeah. Doug, tell people uh, what kind of shape you were in when this was presented to you as, as a possible option. Well, actually, the, uh, the story started uh, back in 1996 uh, when I was diagnosed with, with cancer. CLL, or chronic lymphocytic leukemia to be exact. Um, needless to say, I was terrified. I was only 49 years old, I had a wife and, and four kids. My, my daughter was only nine years old, and I, you know, I just couldn't bear the thought of her growing up without me. But uh, I was really lucky. Um, I didn't have to be treated for a while, and then it was just mild treatment uh, for years. But by uh, 2010, uh, my disease had progressed to the point where uh, it was now resistant to uh, standard chemotherapy. And uh, over 40% of my bone marrow was now cancer cells. So uh, it was bone marrow transplant, or I mean, that was my the last. Uh, my doc, uh, David Porter, my, uh, my oncologist, sat me down and he said, it's time to think about bone marrow transplant. But um, uh, it's still pretty risky, and I'm only about 50% cure rate, and uh, uh, that really was uh, the only choice I had. Otherwise, it was about, uh, he said it was about, probably about two years. And then he said, there is this one clinical trial. And then about a month trial. later, he said, um, you know, we have this new trial where uh, we can take your white cells and, and uh, use them to kill the cancer. So my wife and I uh, read the protocol and it looked like it ought to work, so uh, I was in, absolutely in. You know, they, they talk about cancer as a battle, and uh, I will tell you it is. It's one of the reasons I wanted to do this was because it was a, really an opportunity to fight back, you know, so that you're not just a, a victim of your disease. And so, it was, I, I mean, you got sick. You, you know, it's everything that um, the doctor described, the fever and the, you were really sick, the, right, as the treatment the, um, started? They transformed my white cells and then uh, started to, um, um, over three days, uh, infuse them. Um, nothing happened. Um, it was rather anticlimactic for about a week, uh, actually two weeks, and almost to the hour I woke up uh, with a fever and chills, and uh, that's when I knew um, it was, so you it was were probably happy. working. <laughs> it's working. Yeah, strangely enough, yes, I was, I was pretty excited um, that something was happening. So it was about a week, a little over a week, that these symptoms uh, persisted. It's like having the flu, only, only uh, much worse. Um, got to the point where I had to be hospitalized because my, my kidneys were getting in trouble. Um, but literally, I think, um, uh, Overnight, when they treated the symptoms, I started feeling better. Um, I think it was that day or the next, David Porter walked into my, my uh, hospital room, and, he, and he's, he's holding his, his uh, is cell phone, phone, and he said, hot off the press, 18% of your, your white cells are CART-19 cells. He said, Doug, we can't find a cancer cell in your body. Your bone marrow is completely clean. Completely. And, uh, you can imagine, uh, that was, uh, I decided at that point to declare victory, I was gonna be okay. So, uh, Wait, 
I think we have a picture. Let's put up the picture, too, if we do, of um, what you did when you found out <laughs> so, you were cancer-free. So uh, my wife, I was, I was I discharged day, from right? the hospital um, on uh, that Friday. My wife picked me up. Uh, from the hospital, we drove straight to the Annapolis Boat Show and we bought a sailboat. <laughs> and I mean, think about it. Um, just a few weeks before, I wasn't so sure I had a future. And um, overnight, uh, everything changed. Uh, there was a future, and uh, it was pretty amazing. And he's remained cancer free, there's been nothing. So, he just had his uh, third year anniversary from the treatment. Yep. and. Uh, Two things we found. I mean, the bone marrow, we can analyze down to one in a million cells, you know, and find leukemia cells. In there. So we know to that level there are none. But we can't obviously analyze his whole body. So only time will tell. But he has no leukemia that we can find. And, uh, um, and he still has these CAR cells. So they're in there in the surveillance mode. So we now know that they can last for at least three years. And uh, that, that's really great news. Yep. Yeah. I guess, how confident are you? Or we don't know yet because it's, it's, enough time hasn't passed that this will, you know, be a stable outcome. Yeah, so that's, you know, the, you know, we, Novartis now will start next year, uh, multi-center international trials. So it'll be the first time that a gene therapy trial like this with cells, complicated engineering, will become multi, you know, they've always been at single center boutique trials. So it'll become uh, multi-center and international. So that's a, a big step forward, I think, for cancer therapies. Um, and, you know, our big thing next is to, you know, the whole field now will be asking, can this go beyond blood cancers? I mean, right now it looks like most of the cancers that we now treat with bone marrow transplantation, we can, if, if we're successful, get rid of the need to have a bone marrow transplantation and treat it with the patient's own cells. And uh, so there, then the, the big thing next really is, is, is solid cancers. And, and can we do that's this? That's a big jump, oh, right? Yeah. To go. And they're much more common and you know, generally not curable. Uh, uh, things like pancreatic cancer and brain cancer, the, the therapy is the same as when I was a medical student 30 years ago. It's the same thing and it doesn't work unless you're really lucky you know, and it's caught very early. So that's, that's where we're going to put a lot of our energies is, is, is now uh, moving over to the solid cancers. Um, how optimistic are you, given this breakthrough? Has it, has it sort of, I mean, I mean as you said, it's, it has been literally decades since there has been a breakthrough like this in cancer research, fair to say? Yes, and I, I think, uh, you know, um, so there's been, uh, you know, lots of disappointments. I think now the science advanced, and we can see why the previous attempts failed. And, and then now we have, you know, um, all the tools there to both understand at a deep level the molecular causes of cancer, and then, you know, hit it where the Achilles heel is, we can design therapies that now will we'll fix it. So uh, I, I think the whole field in oncology is very much energized now that targeted therapies like this um, will replace the, the thing. Literally, the therapies that, that are given, the most recently approved therapy for chronic lymphocytic leukemia that Doug has is called bendamustine. And it's an analog of nitrogen mustard, which is what was used to gas people in World War II, and World War I, actually. You know, it's nitrogen mustard. It just, just breaks up DNA. It's completely nonspecific. And, and that's you know, what we used in the 1950s as the first chemotherapy. And so hopefully, you know, it does cure some people, but it's horribly toxic. And there's a lot of optimism now that we're going to move to a whole new paradigm of cancer therapy. It's amazing. Um, congratulations to you, Dr. June. As I said, it's an honor to be on the stage with you. And Doug, congratulations to you, too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.